Hey there, scabby scummers and gangers. Crimson Oracle here, and welcome to Dome Runners TV. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the various factions of Necromunda you can play on the tabletop and how they play. As with anything Necromunda related, this is just an intro. Uh, there's not really a set way that you have to play every gang. There's a lot of customization and personalization that's possible in how you expand beyond your basic house list. And of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of house rules that people use and various things. So this is more going to be an overview of how the gangs tend to play. And this is helpful for new players, I think, and for people considering a second gang, because it will give you an idea of what your experience will be early on. And if over time you want to take things in a different direction, or you want to try to subvert your gang's play style, it's totally doable. I just recommend having a good understanding of what they're good at before you try to subvert it, as with any kind of subversion. <laughs> And before we get into the meat of the video, of course, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to receive notifications for when I make new videos. That's how this channel grows. I appreciate it. So first up, I think it's important to address the six clan houses. These are the major factions of Necromunda. These are the things, the tent poles, things people play the most often. Um, and they play an important role in the background of Necromunda too. Uh, the clan houses are these large social institutions that control most of the means of production on Necromunda. Uh, they own all of the factories, the territory where the mining is done, the smelting uh, infrastructure, everything that is done on Necromunda by the serfs and laborers is done at the auspices of the clan houses. And the gangs are sort of the middle managers that implement that interaction. They are sort of a petite bourgeois or, or maybe even a sort of class trader in those institutions. Um, or, of course, they can be resisting against those institutions from the inside. So it's more complicated than to just say that they're all sort of, you know, landlords or what have you. Uh, these are you know, serious, uh, massive institutions. They run in a feudal hierarchy a lot of the time, um, though with significantly more opportunity for advancement through violence than under a traditional feudal system. And there are six of these houses, Escher, Goliath, Orlok, Cawdor, Bensar, and Delac. Uh, now, after you get through the clan houses, you also run into Venator gangs, which are uh, the hired bounty hunters who stalk through the Underhive and do the work of the institutions of Necromunda. Anyone from the clan houses themselves to contracts from rich guilders, to contracts from noble houses, to even the imperial house, the true rulers of Necromunda themselves. They're the enforcers. They're sort of the police on Necromunda, though they sort of function as much as a gang as they do as any kind of law enforcement, because law on Necromunda is extremely fuzzy. What is and isn't illegal is generally about who you are, not what your, you know, crimes are. Um, then you have the various cults of Necromunda. There is the Chaos Cult or the Helic Cult. These guys are generally average serfs and workers who, after uncovering what one might call the primordial truth or the existence of chaos, they become evangelical in their belief in the powers of chaos and seek out the opportunity to perform a revolution and bring about rituals to the dark gods. Uh, there are also corpse grinder cults, which is a very specific kind of chaos cult that usually arises out of the institution of the Corpse Guild, one of the many institutions on Necromunda that uh, is essential to everyone's well-being, but is also kind of a horror show. Uh, they are responsible for rendering down all of the bodies of the individuals who die on Necromunda in order to reclaim all of the resources in those bodies and use them to produce food. Uh, unfortunately, when individuals are uh, doing this, they are frequently interacting with a warp entity who attempts to win them over, a sort of demon prince who is very specific to Necromunda 
and brings the gift of corn to Necromunda. There are also gene stealer cults. These are infected individuals who are part of a alien invasion which slowly integrates itself into a planet until eventually it can take over and bring about the arrival of the Tyranid hive ships, which will then consume and destroy the planet. Uh, these individuals are also often workers, but unlike the helots of the uh, chaos cults, they are far less individualistic. They are all sort of part of a gestalt hive mind that exists uh, in relationship to a singular master, a patriarch, a, a single gene stealer that has evolved into a brood lord and is slumbering somewhere on Necromunda. Uh, we do not know where at this time. Uh, these are, of course, uh, all outlaw gangs. They are you know, resisting the various uh, institutions of Necromunda in different ways. Now, I, I should say outlaw gangs is complicated because while the gene stealer cults are outlaws in the sense that they are criminals and if their mutations are discovered, they'll be destroyed by the uh, government of Necromunda. In reality, they actually tend to support the status quo until they have the opportunity, the means to take over in as quickly and swiftly a uh, method as possible. Gene Stiller cults have this way of hiding themselves and advancing their opportunities as uh, they infiltrate the leadership of a planet and move their way up the ladder until eventually they can turn off all the defenses and let the Tyranids come down, at which point everyone is kind of horrified and flees as they realize that their dreams were in fact a nightmare. Uh, there are also Ogren gangs. Uh, these are the abhuman, these enormous, muscular, uh, but slow-witted and extremely loyal and friendly creatures known as Ogren. Uh, they're obviously a sort of fantasy ogre imported into, uh, into Warhammer 40,000. Uh, they are used uh, in chattel slavery on Necromunda, and when they do free themselves, they become outlaw gangs who are obviously... Uh, hiding from the law um, because slavery is quite legal on Necromunda. Um, and then you also have the outcast gangs, which are gangs that have developed in the sort of shadows of, of Necromunda. Uh, it, it, they are individuals who follow a charismatic leader uh, or group of leaders, and they are mostly made up of this sort of general, you know, scum of, of Necromunda, the, the general population of Necromunda. We will start by talking about the clan houses. Uh, first up, I'm going to get into Escher, uh, the gang that I play, and the, one of the factions that have gotten uh, the most attention in uh, the various box sets uh, since the game relaunched. House Escher is, of course, a gang of entirely women. Uh, there are very, very, very rarely Escher males, uh, but they are extremely uh, genetically damaged due to House Escher's meddling in their own DNA. Um, this is, you know, sort of a, a thing with Necromunda. Any opportunity for uh, institutions to sort of uh, gain power through manipulation tends to come with costs. And for House Escher, their attempts to engineer themselves to be super beings uh, fell short in a way that while the uh, individuals of House Escher, the women of House Escher, are taller, stronger, uh, more capable, more, more uh, viable individuals, than a lot of the standard humans on Necromunda, better situated to living in the hives and all of that. Unfortunately, that has come with the cost that the people of uh, House Escher are stuck with this genetic curse. Uh, 
Now, House Escher are the chemists of Necromunda. They produce most of the illegal drugs, uh, the legal drugs, the substances, the medication. Anything that has a sort of chemical genesis winds up involving House Escher in one way or another, even up to and including the uh, stims that make House Goliath's bodies possible and the technology that keeps the Vansar from dying of radiation poisoning all comes from House Escher. House Escher is an interesting uh, on the tabletop faction because I think that they are very much a finesse faction, but they come in the starter set, so a lot of people will get their hands on them. And there are a couple of different ways that they sort of tend to play. The first of which is as a very kind of shooting heavy, low quality, high volume shooting. Escher has very, uh, very affordable gangers. You can get a lot of them and they can get las guns for very cheap. And you could, in theory, put a ton of las guns on the board and be a gang that excels at drawing your opponent in and just wearing them down through weight of fire not necessarily quality of fire but quantity has a quality unto itself as they say uh asher i think played that way can be a little bit boring um it, it's sort of like playing imperial guard in <laughs> 40k where you're a little bit static and slow because you're constantly having to shoot because you need to get as many shots in on each individual as possible because you're going to do relatively little damage per shot so you have to have a lot of them uh that is a viable strategy but you know it depends on the individual whether that appeals to you uh the other thing asher excel at is close combat uh, the leaders and the Death Maidens in particular of House Escher are absolute blenders. They can get into combat and do hellacious amounts of damage. Uh, it's not necessarily going to uh, be the ideal toolkit for taking down every single opponent in the game, um, but a Escher with the uh, right skills and the right weaponry is an absolute murder bot. And I recommend running them this way myself. That's how I run them, so I'm biased. Escher also have a special rule system for producing toxins and uh, applying them to their weapons and gas weapons and all that stuff. And this system is really cool. Personally, I haven't had a chance to really explore it on the tabletop yet, but my gang in my current campaign has just made enough credits and hired the clan chemists that they need in order to start mixing up dangerous chemical cocktails. So I am going to be exploring them extensively in the near future, and uh, you can catch more of that on my upcoming battle reports. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I think that Asher is a really fun gang if you want the opportunity to play with weird status effects, doing kind of strange things to your opponents, because that, that's what the stims really give you an opportunity. The stims and the, the poisons and stuff give you the opportunity to experience. Um, this is not the gang for everyone. Uh, they are going to have some serious drawbacks compared to a lot of the other gangs, uh, but one thing that they really have going for them is that they have access to agility skills, which means that they have one of the absolute best close combat skills in the game, Spring Up. Spring Up allows an Escher who has been pinned to take an initiative check, and guess what? Escher initiative is fantastic, uh, in order to stand up and then be able to fight in the subsequent activation, even though they were pinned at the start. Uh, there is another skill that is similarly useful in the game, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow you to get out of being pinned. Instead, it allows you to avoid being pinned. And while that seems like it's kind of the same thing, it's actually less strategically useful because it means that your fighter has to stay standing and, and exposed, whereas an Escher fighter will take cover and then jump up and still stab you later that turn. So it is down to your personal play style, but Escher are a finesse gang. They want to move quickly. Positioning is extremely important. You want to be able to get your fighters where you need them to be 
and you want to use the fact that you have access to cheap bodies as a way to insulate and protect your fighters. Uh, personally, I like to take a lot of juves uh, with stiletto knives as part of my gang because I think that they are a lot of fun and they happen to be uh, a great way to avoid taking you know an incoming charge or getting shot too much or what have you uh, by putting your juves in the line of fire they also you know develop uh, as fighters and gain experience and they're there for things like coup de gras so it is a sort of a virtuous cycle as a sort of almost contrast to escher you have the beefy the foolish and the uh you know, uh, lovable Goliaths. These are enormous, almost space marine sized individuals, humans that are genetically engineered to maximize durability and muscle production. The Goliaths were actually a creation of Necromunda. Uh, they are almost an abhuman species, but they aren't registered with the general Imperium. They, everybody just sort of looks the other way with them. Uh, the Goliaths are very much a gang that excels in taking damage and coming at you no matter uh, how much you throw at them. And their ability to absolutely wreck people in close combat is legendary. Uh, they are significantly less useful as a shooting gang uh, compared to House Escher. They are definitely more in the heavy close combat kind of realm. And I think that it works well for them. Uh, this is a gang that, of course, uh, can take uh, certain certain shooting attacks that are wonderful. You know, you get this dual grenade launcher uh, on your stimmers that can be extremely cool for putting down just an astronomical amount of pie plates on your opponent. Uh, but overall, I think that the Goliaths tend to lean towards a more aggressive uh, less cautious and more punch uh, until your opponent is dead kind of gameplay. Uh, the Goliaths get what's called gene smithing, which is the ability to make subtle changes to the genetics of your fighters when you recruit them that allows them to be customized in various ways. Uh, this is a useful system because Goliaths at base are fairly expensive. So by taking various drawbacks and advantages, you can produce Goliaths that are extremely focused on one thing that they do really well, and that will allow them to excel. Now, this can be somewhat daunting for a new person to dive into, much like the Escher Chems, but unlike the Escher Chems, the Goliaths have to choose their gene smithing at recruitment, because obviously it's their genetics. So unfortunately for those players, uh, the Goliath gang does require a little bit of pre-thought and, and attention to all of that before you get into playing the game. Uh, that's honestly totally manageable. You just sort of need to look at the stats and look at all the various gene smithing upgrades and drawbacks, and you'll have an idea of what your gang uh, is going to need, I think. Uh, I tend to not play with that element of it as much when I'm building Goliath lists, but that's just because personally, I don't want to get too gamey with anything I'm doing as I'm the arbitrator and I want my players to have a good time. Uh, there is also, of course, House Orlock. These are what you might call the, you know, th this has traditionally been considered the sort of basic human faction on Necromunda. And while that is conceptually kind of true, they actually kind of share that with House Cawdor. Uh, but we can kind of get into that when we get to House Cawdor. For House Orlock, these are the, the individuals who control most of the mining and shipping on Necromunda, who handle a lot of the transportation on the, the ash roads between hives and do a lot of that sort of business. Uh, known as the House of Iron, they are obviously mining metals uh, from the surface of the planet. Unfortunately, uh, on Necromunda, most of the naturally occurring resources have been mined already. So what they actually wind up doing is mining the ruins and waste of the past civilizations of Necromunda, digging it up and smelting it down to export 
off the you know, planet and use in the general wars that the Imperium is fighting. Now, uh, House Orlock on the tabletop are very focused on the sort of slug based weapons that you encounter in Necromunda, you know, things that fire actual rounds, not laser weapons necessarily. Uh, they are very, very, very good at the sort of mid range shooting. That is what is going to be a lot of your shooting interactions in Necromunda. Um, there are gangs that are way better at close combat, uh, several in fact, and there are gangs that are better at shooting, uh, but House Orlock tends to be a nice solid start for someone who is looking to play a, a more kind of generic, uh, basic kind of human gang that's not too focused on finesse or too focused on just brutal upfront charging. Uh, they are able to take what are called legendary names. Uh, these are really fun and characterful little upgrades that each of your characters gets to take and you can purchase more as they advance. Uh, they are very much uh, designed around giving your individual a sort of uh, ability that fits with a very specific theme. Uh, and all of them are very kind of, uh, you know, biker gang, uh, smuggler kind of names and, and reputations and, and abilities. So Orlock are really ideal if you want a gang that is going to be a jack of all trades, that is going to be able to shoot okay, it's going to be able to punch where it needs to, but which isn't going to focus hard into either of those things. Next up you have House Cawdor. Now, while Orlock at the reputation for being the most uh, basic of the houses, House Cawdor actually represents far larger of a population on Necromunda than House Orlock. House Cawdor are the sort of teeming masses of Necromunda, uh, though they are not themselves the helots and serfs that make up the bulk of the planet's population. Getting into House Cawdor is probably the easiest of the six houses, and it is going to be the hardest to rise up because they are just so massive. Uh, House Cawdor definitely tends to lean into having a lot of bodies on the tabletop. Uh, they tend to have worse weapons and worse gear. Uh, their house list has significantly less armor options, for example, than a lot of the other clan houses. Uh, they have some different unique ones that are actually really cool. And I'll probably get into what building these various gang lists looks like in future episodes. But suffice to say that House Cawdor is a gang that is going to rely on numbers in a way that is, you know, fundamentally different from all the other basic house gangs, down to the point where they can actually bring extra fighters in beyond the normal limits and otherwise uh, punch a little bit differently than everybody else. Uh, the gang also has a cool system called uh, Faith that they use in order to change things on the battlefield. Um, this can really be fun for making strategic choices about how to use this sort of extra resource that you get as a Cawdor player. Uh, the only downside is that some of it is a little bit too gamey. Uh, there is the ability, for example, to turn your fighters into, you know, explosive suicide bombers, uh, which is fun at first but can get a little bit tedious if you do it over and over again. There's also an ability that lets you use your own casualties for your opponent's bottle check. The idea being that they've slaughtered so many of your fighters, but you continue to press on and attack. And that is terrifying for the individual because they feel like they've killed five people already and there's more people coming. What are they even going to do to get out of the situation? Uh, so that is something that can really be excessive. Uh, the first time that you pull off that trick, especially if you use it in concert with the other uh, ability to have your juves blow themselves up, it is hilarious. But if that is how you continue to win every single game, your opponents will start to get bored. <laughs> or they'll just build up huge gangs and your bottle checks won't be enough to uh, take them out. But regardless, it's a 
very uh, interesting system and one I think that takes a little bit of getting used to. Uh, so House Cawdor, I would say, are a gang that is a little tougher to play because of the faith system on top, uh, but which is extremely rewarding and extremely narratively focused. It really plays into the exact kind of story of the gang, and I definitely recommend checking them out at some point. Next up is House Van Sar. Uh, these are the uh, tech specialists of the clan houses. These guys are in possession of a secret piece of technology that gives them an enormous advantage over everyone else in terms of accessing and developing weapons and weapon systems. And as a result, they are very, very good at shooting. They have a lot of laser weapons that other gangs don't even have access to. Um, but they are also slowly dying of radiation poisoning, and uh, that is a major downside for them. Now, I will say that I wish that House Vansar had a little bit more of a drawback from the uh, radiation poisoning element. Uh, unfortunately, it's tough when you're building a game like this where freedom is important. Uh, it allows you to build Vansar that become these sort of brutal bruisers through advancing their toughness and wounds and stuff. And I think that they should potentially be hard capped at, say, toughness four. Um, because I don't think that Toughness 5 on a Vansar really makes sense. Uh, I just don't think that that is thematically what they're supposed to be. But, you know, differences of opinion and all that. Uh, so in House Vansar, you have uh, a wide variety of shooting options. Uh, there are some interesting close combat options as well. Vansar uses energy shields, among other things, uh, which can be a really fun thing to add to your gang, both because they look really cool and because they can make your fighters, which are not necessarily designed for close combat, potentially viable in close combat. Um, I have a Vansar gang that's very close combat focused, and that is just because I am, uh, once again, the kind of person who wants to deconstruct any of those uh, those house tropes that are, you know, going to be the the mainstay of what you see on the tabletop. Uh, so when people see Vansar, they assume they're going to see lots of plasma weapons. They're going to get, you know, uh, a lot of uh, fighters that hang back and try to shoot as much as possible. And so I try to do my own thing and, and uh, you know, make a gang that will get into the thick of it and, and scrap. But really, House Vensar is not going to do as well at combat as the other combat-focused houses, and instead they wind up really excelling at shooting, at uh, advancement through the uh, ability to gain extra income uh, from the fixer ability. Uh, Vensar also has access to a system of Augmentics. These are advancements that you can purchase uh, that allow you to repair injuries uh, because injury is an important part of Necromunda, but they also allow you to enhance your fighters uh, various ways beyond their sort of baseline uh, needs. So there are basic Augmentics that you can buy any gang that just restore damage to the various areas that you can have injured. Uh, but Vansar's Augmentics go several levels beyond and give you various uh, advancements that are very useful uh, on the tabletop. So House Vansar is uh, kind of like Goliath in that you can change core things about your fighters, but those Augments are aftermarket. So you're generally speaking not going to be able to afford much of them. Uh, or potentially uh, at all with your fighters uh, at the start of the game. But as you develop, as you start taking injuries, as it becomes uh, worthwhile for you to invest in those advancements, they will become significantly stronger, which is really cool. And it's sort of, it's like the Goliath's option, but it's sort of the opposite, where Goliath have to be created a specific way, but Mansour allows them to specialize based off of what you need them to do and where they get hurt. Uh, and then, of course, finally, there is House Delac. Now, House Delac is something of a, a enigma to approach. Uh, initially, they were more focused on sneaking, subtlety, infiltration, long range shooting, uh, getting in the right place and that sort of uh, 
let precision strike that disables your opponent, that sort of thing. Um, but with the release of House of Shadows, Galak expanded substantially and are now also a very sort of psychic focused gang with a wide variety of options to give your fighters psychic powers. Uh, your Galak fighters are going to be able to do interesting things with their psychic abilities. Uh, now, I wouldn't say that they're all amazing and I think that it takes a lot of practice and work to get good at using psychic powers in Necromunda, but the Delac are a really, really cool thematic gang, and their main gimmick is actually, like I was saying, the psychic power system that they have. Uh, what's cool about them is that nearby fighters form a psychic choir, and together they're able to project powers further and do uh, more things with them. This is really fun. Uh, Delac are definitely a gang that you're going to want to put in uh, situations where you have overwhelming force over your opponent. Uh, they are probably not going to be the best stand-up fighters in terms of showing down uh, another fighter one-on-one. -on -one. So Delac is a very finesse-focused gang and you're going to want to get really uh, well acquainted with the psychic powers and really make sure that you're making the right choices when you're purchasing those. Uh, because I think that with House Delac, it's easy to make a gang which is not going to work very well on the tabletop. So be careful with House Delac, they're a little trickier. Uh, they don't have as much sort of wiggle room as House Vansar or House Kaldor do in terms of uh, putting yourself out of position or taking a, a loadout that is suboptimal. So uh, I would be careful with House Delac, do a little bit more research, spend a little bit more time making your choices before you invest in uh, the specific powers and all of that. Um, I do like that their brute comes in the box uh, with their expansion gang. They're the only one where you get a brute easily like that. So definitely check that out. Uh, plus the Piscean Spectre is a really cool model. But regardless, uh, those are the six clan houses. Each is capable of uh, doing really well in the game, but they have different strengths and different weaknesses. And that's just a, an overview. Um, and then after that, you also have uh, the Enforcers. I'm gonna jump to them. The Enforcers are an interesting gang because while they have good gear, uh, owing to their position as the law enforcement on Necromunda, they have well-maintained bolt guns with significantly better uh, ammo rolls, and they have the uh, Enforcer shotgun, which is essentially a really high-quality combat shotgun. And between those two weapons and a bunch of the other stuff that they have, uh, including various stun weapons, uh, shock weapons, that sort of thing, the Enforcers play to their theme of being police, doing riot suppression really well, uh, with a sort of, you know, brutality of the kind of police force that carries rocket launchers on their hip. Um, and they are going to struggle to uh, keep up in a lot of, in the Dominion campaign, the basic campaign that a lot of people play, because the Enforcers are not allowed to hold territory which is kind of a quirk of the system on Necromunda. They're not able to hold and maintain the various infrastructure that brings income. And so as a result, they have to rely on getting all their income on the tabletop uh, and through various conniving activities like taking over territory and then selling it to other fighters, uh, to other opponents. So the enforcers are a little bit tricky to learn. Uh, you have to get pretty comfortable with uh, their loadouts and, and gearing towards what works well for them. Um, and they are going to potentially struggle in the long run to keep up with the campaign. Um, this can be solved a number of ways, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that in a future episode. And of course, there are Venator gangs. Uh, these are groups of bounty hunters that come together. This is the Swiss army knife of Necromunda gangs. Uh, Venators are able to take one of four different stat lines, uh, each which focus in a different direction and give them a ton of flexibility for choosing the exact right stats for your fighter. 
Uh, they are able to access the trading post in order to purchase their equipment. This means that in a vendor gang, you have almost unlimited customization. You can look at the trading post PDF that they've posted on the uh, Warhammer community site. You can see the vast, vast options that your fighters will have access to. And that is really cool and it can be a little bit daunting. So I tend to recommend people play one of the clan houses before they get into playing Venators. Uh, Venators are more focused on capturing uh, their opponents and selling them than they are on the holding of territory. Uh, so you will have to adjust to that if you're playing in a Dominion campaign. Um, and they don't have a gimmick the way that the clan houses do because that's not really their thing. They're more like a group of specialists who have been selected for a very specific purpose and mission. Uh, they are not going to uh, have as much customization and uniqueness uh, in the sense of the, the clan houses because they could be anybody. Um, you also have the various cults. Uh, first of all, you have the Corpse Grinder cult, which are an extremely melee focused faction uh their fighters their their champions and uh their leader are really brutal um their juve equivalent initiates are sneaky uh they actually get infiltrate as a basic ability uh, on their stat line which is kind of bonkers because that's a skill that's you know very valuable and you have to uh dedicate a champion to getting it uh, if you're a Delac or, or one of the other gangs that has access to uh, that skill tree. Um, they are one of the gangs that is easiest to overdo. Uh, they have weapons that do hellacious amounts of injuries, which can lead to needing to retire fighters from the sheer amount of damage that they take. And they have lots of little tricks for getting themselves across the board and embedded in their opponent's spine in a quick fashion. Uh, personally, I think that this gang plays really well and are a lot of fun. You just have to be a little bit, uh, circumspect about your choices. Um, I tend to not take all of the most optimal war gear when you're running corpse grinders because it can be a little bit unfun to get absolutely smashed and have fighters, uh, have to go out of the game after one game of <laughs> taking, you know, five, six, seven injury rolls from, from one, uh, string of attacks. So I think that corpse grinders are definitely unique and uh, a really fun gang. And I think that people are too quick to dismiss them as being overpowered. Uh, but I am, you know, just one person. So it's uh, a difference of, a, of opinion a little bit. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. That, that's as far as I'll go with it. Uh, and then there's, of course, the Chaos Helot gangs. Uh, now, these are more basic gangs that are using, you know, basically reclaimed weapons, anything they can get their hands on. And they are pretty limited in terms of what options they can take starting out. Once you get access to the trading post and the black market, it's not as bad. Uh, but Helot gangs are going to have uh they're gonna have a witch uh which has psychic powers that's pretty cool uh they are going to have the access to dark rituals which allows them to sacrifice an individual to either become uh, more empowered or uh, to become a chaos spawn or a, one of those you know options uh they can dedicate themselves to different chaos gods uh, and in the vein of uh, Necromunda having just massive amounts of options, uh, they, of course, can also corrupt house gangs and house gang can be used as a chaos gang. But that is a topic for a totally different day. And then, of course, you have the Gene Stealer cults. These are also workers. Um, they have very similar kind of options to the Helot gangs, uh, featuring a little bit more of the industrial mining equipment that you uh, will get in the Gene Stealer Cult kits. Uh, they are a lot of fun as well, but they are just a little bit less uh, sort of wild and uh, crazy the, than the uh, cult, the Helic cult gangs, because they don't have that dark ritual element where you're able to kind of change between the various gods and get special buffs from choosing those gods. Uh, so they're not quite as flexible 
Um, but they do get access to a really cool ability to buy a third arm and the various things that come with that. Uh, overall, uh, the Gene Stiller cult gangs are, you know, something somewhat a little bit more basic uh, than uh, the other gangs of Necromunda and are, are one of the more generic of the gangs. Even though they have such a flavorful background, uh, they're just a little bit less uh, customizable as you play the game. Uh, than the others. Uh, and then, of course, you have the Slave Ogren. These are the ogres that we talked about earlier. They are very, very niche. They're focused very specifically on melee combat. They can pretty much only take one real shooting weapon that's got a decent range, and that shooting weapon is got a decent chance of blowing up the person who is firing it. So it's a little bit of a kind of a nerve wracking thing uh, to use when you have fighters that are so large and expensive as the Ogren. It's tough to have your own uh, <laughs> weapon remove your bottle from the board so uh, a lot of people tend to focus on taking grenades and otherwise doing close combat with their ogren and that is totally a viable option uh, they also have the ability to take lobotomized models which can't be pinned which is really fun for uh, screening and getting your opponent locked down in close combat with tough fighters that aren't going to flee so uh, Ogren are a close combat gang that is more uh, about controlling your smaller number of fighters and figuring out exactly when and where to hit your opponent uh, than the, the sort of uh, all out bum rush of Kaudor where you have unlimited bodies and you, know, you can kind of just swarm your opponent. So just a very different play style while still being very close combat oriented. And then finally, we have the outcast gangs. Uh, these are gangs that form around a charismatic individual. So you have a ton of customization options for your leadership of this gang. You can even include pretty much any model in the game as a leader. Uh, anything from an ogre with uh, you know heavy weapons to the various noble houses and guilds and outlaws and all of those sort of gangs uh, or, or allies that you can bring into your battles. You can take one of those individuals and any of the, or even any of the dramatis personae or characters or any of that, and you can build a gang around them. That's really fun, uh, but the rest of the gang is very much going to be the sort of basic scummer model. You know, these guys are not particularly uh, skillful or good at any one thing but they are there and they have that going for them. So this gang will kind of depend on how you build them, but you're going to tend to have a small core of very powerful individuals and then a very, very large number of relatively ineffective fighters. It's like Kador in a way, but without faith powers. And I think that it's really cool and a fun toolkit, but I strongly recommend starting with a different gang because the options are so broad in this gang, it can be almost impossible to figure out exactly what you want. And it's so complicated that even the Yak Tribe website that everyone uses to uh, make their gangs and their gang cards and print them out uh, does not yet implement the, the option to build those gangs because uh, they are just so complicated. You wind up having to do it with custom, uh, custom selections. So those are the various factions of Necromunda that you can play on the tabletop. We will have more soon. I know Ash Wastes are going to be coming out probably in the next few months, and there will be more further after that, I'm quite sure. Uh, but this was, you know, just intended as a quick guide to you for when you're picking a gang, trying to figure out exactly what their strengths are, what you can lean towards. Uh, I'm going to cover each gang individually in far more depth. I also have on my podcast, The Dome Runners, I've done an episode on almost every single gang in the game. Uh, I actually have just finished my second Gene Stealer Cult episode, and there is another episode uh, coming on Outcasts in a few months. Uh, so I am, you know, I try to trail new releases by a bit so that everyone has time to get a feel for how they play on the tabletop. Uh, but that is largely, uh, you know, 
where I would recommend going from here. If you're interested in those gangs, you can get a lot more information about them from those episodes, which you can see in the show notes. And with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for watching. Uh, these videos are a lot of fun to make, and I love to spread the good word of Necromunda to the various uh, people of the internet. So thank you for watching. Uh, thank you to my patrons for helping support me producing this wonderful content. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you too can become a patron for as little as $5 a month. And when you do so, your name will be added to the credits at the end of these videos, and you will be uh, eligible to receive a early episode of the Dome Runners uh, before everyone else gets it, uh, the podcast. So check that out, patreon.com, search Dome Runners. And of course, the Dome Runners podcast. Don't forget to check out the podcast. Uh, I've done a ton of coverage of every facet of the game on there. And I'm trying to make video content uh, as quickly as possible to fill in a lot of those details that I've done on the show. Uh, but of course, video content is just a lot more work to produce and to, to kind of get it right takes a lot more effort so i am uh very very gradually working my way through all that stuff and i will bring a lot of those ideas over even if the uh, podcast kind of remains its own thing so don't forget to check that out uh and with that thank you so much for watching everyone stay safe and don't forget to change your paint water <laughs>